Well, hello and welcome to this very special bonus episode of the Fantastic History of Food. And today I'm breaking away from my usual format of pure storytelling to chat with the amazing author Lydia Moland. Uh, Lydia is so much more than simply an author. She is also a philosophy lecturer at Colby College in Maine, an institution that has been around for over 200 years. She has written for publications like the Paris Review, the Boston Globe, and the Washington Post, to name but a few. And now, Lydia, you get to add a guest appearance on the fantastic history of food to your already glittering career. Welcome. Thank you. I'm honored to add that to my career, and thank you for that introduction. <laughs> Not a problem at all. Well, I I've been looking forward to chatting to you, and obviously very specifically about your upcoming book. But first, before we get into that, I actually noticed that you have a PhD qualification, but by all accounts, in all of our correspondence, you don't go by Dr. Lydia Milland. And if that was me, I would be putting doctor on my Uber Eats orders. You've earned it. <laughs> yes, it, it's true. Um, but I guess I just, I've gotten used to it. So I don't feel like I need to put it on everything anymore. But it is true. No, I, I did manage to get myself a PhD. Well, congratulations. Anyway, let's get down to business and chat about your upcoming book, all about an incredible woman, also by the name of Lydia, but this time uh, Lydia Maria Child. Uh, and we can drill down into the specifics as we go along. But to start with, can you just give me a short overview of who she was, why she was such an important figure in history and why she still is, uh, and what it was about her specifically that drew you to make her the subject of your upcoming book? Yes, thank you. Happily. So Lydia Maria Child was born in 1802 in Medford, Massachusetts, which is close to Boston. And she, um, by the time she was in her late 20s, she had accomplished something almost unheard of in the very young American landscape, which was that she was a self-sufficient female author. She had published a couple of novels she had um, published a couple of children's books and, and was editing a very successful children's periodical, which was one of the first of its kind in the United States. And in 1829, and this is part of why I think she's such an interesting um, topic for your wonderful podcast, mm. she published something called The Frugal Housewife. And it was a kind of self-help book. It was a pioneering mm in the United States also to talk about um, how to take care of yourself. Um, and it had recipes. It was a cookbook in some ways, but also a guide to getting rid of bed bugs and curing dysentery and figuring out how to help if someone sprained their ankle or cut their finger. But it had this very interesting subtitle, which was dedicated to those who are not ashamed of economy. <laughs> that was, it was very pointed. Mm. Um, and I think this was because she had already made it. She was a baker's daughter, but she had made it mm. into the kind of glittering Boston literary social circle. So then as now, Boston thought of itself as really the intellectual hub of the United States. And she had managed to convince them to admit her as one of their members, as it were. Mm. And she had been pretty distressed by what she saw as these new Americans' obsession with luxury. Mm. And no uh, insult to any of your British listeners, but she was afraid that what was happening was that the American public was, or the upper classes, were reproducing a kind of aristocracy. And so she decided, for a lot of reasons, which I'll get into more in a moment, that she didn't want to be part of that, and that instead mm. she wanted to write for those who were, as she put it, not ashamed of economy. So mm. the book is specifically written for poor Americans um, and mm. for Americans who were trying to be self-sufficient. And she mm. was very principled about this. She was determined that people see that that kind of self-sufficiency was crucial to American democracy, that if you wow. wanted to be a real democracy, you had to learn how to make your own soap. <laughs> you, you couldn't <laughs> just rely on domestics. You couldn't always rely on um, others to help you. And part of what's interesting to me about this story is that she learned some of that in Maine. So Maine, for your listeners who don't know, is just east, sorry, <laughs> north of Boston. It's on the East Coast. And it, it is, then as now, uh, thought of as the kind of wild, <laughs> wonderful, mm. but um, not as civilized neighbor of Massachusetts. Mm. 
There's also New Hampshire, which is between us. But yeah. anyway, um, so she um, so so she learned a lot about self-sufficiency in Maine, which didn't have a big city like Boston where you could rely on um, on getting other people to do your work for you. Mm. So anyway, we can talk more about that later, since I think that's one of the ways she ties beautifully into um, the subject that you're so good at talking about. Um, but the the reason she's an important literary figure to me is that in 1830, she met a man named William Lloyd Garrison, who was mm. one of the most prominent white American abolitionists. So an abolitionist mm. in the United States in the 1830s was someone who believed that slavery should end immediately, immediately mm. and without compensation to enslavers. Mm. This in the 1830s was a radical position. I there's a historian named Kelly Carter Jackson who says that it is like calling yourself a communist in 1950s America. It just wow. was a kind of social stigma to call yourself an abolitionist because most Bostonians and most northerners thought that slavery was okay you know it was not maybe it was maybe mm. unfortunate it maybe would be better if it weren't the case um but they had all kinds of justifications for believing mm. that mm. it should either continue or end very gradually mm. oh in their mind so, somewhat of a necessary evil exactly a necessary evil or there were certainly people who argued that africans and their descendants were better off enslaved because at least then they were being converted to Christianity. So there, wow. there were all kinds of justifications used to, um, to continue enslavement. And the North was also very bound up economically with the South. Mm. There were a lot of Northern businesses that depended on the Southern cotton trade, for instance. Mm. Um, and also, again, for your listeners who um, might not know their American history, um, there had already been several moments in American history when the union between North and South had almost failed over mm. the topic of slavery. So yeah. there were lots of Northern politicians who were very determined that their constituents not rock that boat. Right, right. Anyway, um, to, to finish that part of the story, she was convinced she converted to abolitionism. She definitely described it as a conversion experience. Mm. And she determined never to live her life the same way again. And she spent the next three years researching and writing a book that she called An Appeal in Favor of That Class of Americans Called Africans. Mm. This book... And if, if you'd like to talk about it more, I'd be happy to. This book was a kind of fire hose of denunciation of slavery. There was mm. a chapter on economics. There was a chapter on politics. There was a chapter on history. There were chapters about Africans and their descendants arguing that they were not morally and intellectually inferior, but had a noble history with many um, representatives who had been politicians and artists and authors um, and then the last chapter is called something like um, Our Duties as Regards Racial Prejudice. And mm. in it, Child attacked her own fellow Northerners and wow. said, which was true, that slavery was only possible because Northern industry and Northern prejudice sustained it. Mm. So you can imagine your average Bostonian did not want to hear this. And they especially did not want to hear it from a woman. Women were not sure. supposed to get involved in politics. And they definitely did not want to hear it from a woman that they had learned to trust as a purveyor of advice, of homey domestic advice about mm. how to stuff a mattress and you know, <laughs> how to roast a pig. They trusted this woman. She was kind of a household name. They had let her educate their children. And suddenly she was calling her politicians racists and her, you know, her the economic system corrupt. So the, the short story on that is that she was ostracized very explicitly mm -hmm. from Boston society. She lost her readership. She lost her income. And she oh. spent the next 30 years continuing to fight 
for abolitionism, um, but always as a kind of outsider. So that's a, a kind of overview of the beginning of her life anyway, and in part how her writing about food connected to her political radicalism. Absolutely. And it seems like it's such a clever tactic. You know, I don't think this is how she meant it, but it ended up being that way that she kind of, you know, she got into the hearts and minds of people through um, things that were, you know, important to them and then and then brought something that, you know, she felt was even more important. And at that point, That's it's right. a choice. Do you go like this person that we've always trusted and listened to? Do we continue to trust and listen to or do we now throw the baby out with the bathwater and everything she's ever said is now wrong? But it seems like she she had always sort of been someone who leaned towards the underdog, so to speak. Uh, even with regards to her book, like you mentioned, it, it was a very pointed title. She even said at one point it was it was a book that was written for the poor and that, and, you know, those who could afford to eat well and eat in luxury were probably better served reading a different author's book because she was very much making a statement, this is not for you. Uh, in your research, is there any other evidence of her kind of growing up with such a well-defined sense of justice or was it something that simply developed in her as she grew older? Yeah, wonderful question. Um, so her father, as I say, was a baker and he um, became rather successful. So by the time she was a young woman, he had turned his bakery into, actually, there was a transatlantic success. They exported mm -hmm. some of what they baked uh, to England. And he very clearly believed that his responsibility was to give back to his community. So mm -hmm. um, there's this very famous American holiday Thanksgiving and in which Americans cook a lot. And there's an idea that we are just supposed to spend a day being grateful for what we have. And he would spend that holiday um, cooking for the people that worked for him. And then, and this, this is a, a slight aside, but ironically, mm -hmm she later turned her memories of Thanksgiving into one of the most famous poems ever written in the United States, uh, which every American school child learns. It's called Over wow. the River and Through the Wood to Grandmother's House We Go, or Grandfather's, wow. depending. Um, but th that aside, and I'd, I'd be happy to talk about that as part of, her, of the just irony of how she's famous. But yeah. back to, to Thanksgiving, and he, he clearly he was on record someone described him as hating slavery. Wow. So she grew up in a household where the attitude towards enslavement was that it was wrong. But mm. I think generally that nothing could be done about it. She then as a teenager moved to Maine and here she encountered um, Native Americans. They were then as now called the Wabanaki. Mm. And she spent time with them and learned about their history. There'd been a massacre of Native, Native Americans by British soldiers um, in the past in the neighborhood, it's, or in the, in the town where she lived. And just by observing Native Americans and learning about their history, I think she developed a very early fear that the American, that American history involves some pretty significant atrocities. Mm. Mm. And I think that opened up her mind to wondering what else she needed to be aware of. And so when she, and so she was already very receptive to the idea that American history had some skeletons buried. Well, not even sure. buried because it was still going on at the time, as yeah. was enslavement. Um, and so I think that that made her more open to as you say, being aware of the less fortunate in her community. I'll also, mm -hmm. One other thing I'll say is that when she was a young woman living in Maine, Maine decided to try to secede from Massachusetts. So it had wow. been part of Massachusetts. Yeah. And um, so they applied for statehood as a free state. And Congress, the Southern politicians in Congress decided that they would admit Maine as a free state only if another slave state was allowed. And this wow. had not yet happened in the United States. Um, slavery had not been allowed to expand. So people mm -hmm. had, Northerners, I think, Northern politicians anyway, had hoped that slavery would just kind of be strangled down there in a couple of Southern states and not mm. expand. Um, but in exchange for their own statehood, Mainers agreed to allow Missouri to be admitted as a slave state. 
And so mm. I think Child's early political consciousness was bound up in that pretty awful moral compromise that Mainers mm. had um, traded their political freedom for the literal enslavement of mm. Africans and their descendants in the South. It seems that even from the earliest of times, um, she was always seeking to be a quite a contrarian voice to the prevailing narrative at the time throughout, you know, you can kind of see it in, in her later life. But maybe can you tell us a bit more about her very first work, which was published, I think you were talking about her experience with the, the Native American tribes, the Wabanaki, I think you, you said. Mm -hmm. And I believe it was at the age of just 22 years old when she wrote her very first um, novel. Uh, I'm not sure the correct pronunciation, but I'm going to attempt to say a Habomak or Habomak or? I, I think it's Habomak, but I'm, I'm also not entirely sure, I have to admit. Yeah. Well, can you tell us a little bit more about if you if you have any insight into what, and I know what the story was all about, and maybe just give us a brief overview, but how that maybe was also quite a significant piece of literature at the time. Yes, yeah, so she uh, wrote this novel about a young woman, um, a descendant of the Mayflower, so a you know very early American, uh, European American, who fell in love with a young man who was also um, European, but also had very intense feelings for a Native American warrior whose name was Habamuk. And it's clear that he, Habamuk, loved her. Mm. She's in love with the European American, but through one of these sort of ingenious 19th century plots, um, she thinks that he has died. And she thinks that it is her father's fault that he has died. Uh. She then, as a kind of revenge, marries this Native American warrior and runs away and is disowned by her family and, you know, considered a, a lost cause, essentially. But she she lives with Habamak. She They have a child together. And then at a certain point, um, her earlier love, the European, reappears. He's not mm -hmm. dead. And... And Habamak at that point, as she describes it, as Child describes it, generously and nobly relinquishes his right to her and their child wow. and disappears into the wilderness, never to be seen again. And so she um, ends up then marrying, uh, officially, I guess, um, this European-American. So it's a book that includes an interracial marriage, mm. a divorce a biracial mm. child um, and a rebellious young woman who is yeah. very clearly the heroine and her father, who's this strict Puritan is, is clearly one of the villains of the story and is, mm. you know, is shown to be a, a bigot and um, small minded and in the end has to repent. Mm. Um, so it was scandalous in all of those ways. And she had to work pretty hard to get people to read it. But once people mm. read it, it became very popular. But what's even more um, interesting and radical about the book is that American fiction, such as it was at that point, and there wasn't a lot of it, um, when it had to do with Native Americans, which very quickly became a favorite theme of American literature, it almost always ended with a massacre, with yes. uh, Europeans... Um, victorious over the savage, quote unquote, natives mm. who had to be exterminated if European Americans were going to be able to uh, engage in their manifest destiny of taking over the continent. Right. So Child's vision in this novel was much more, um, it, was, it was very problematic in its own way, but it suggested that violence against Native Americans was unjust. Mm. And also unnecessary because yeah. Native Americans were in some sense destined for extinction and if left alone would go quietly. Mm. And she also wrote children's fiction around this time in which she also argued this, that Native Americans, it was, it was terrible the way they had been treated by European settlers, but in the end they were destined for extinction. And it was also very early in her life that she decided that that was wrong. Not only was it false, but it was morally wrong to claim that. And she mm. spent um, the rest of her life also advocating for Native Americans 
for their right to self-defense. So not only their right to exist, but their right to fight back when they were attacked. So in all of these ways, she was a very early and progressive voice in Native American um, justice issues. Although I will also say she never gave up her belief that what would be best for Native Americans is if they would assimilate to Mm. essentially European culture, Mm. which was a belief that caused you know, ongoing harm that continues to this day. So that it's a, yeah. it's a complicated record on her part. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, it's a very brave thing to do for a 22 year old woman at that time to, to write a novel like that. And, and maybe potentially that was why she wrote under the, the um, a very clever pseudonym of an American, yes. which I thought was quite, which was quite funny. But, um, you know, for the purposes of this show, obviously primarily a history podcast, which is fa- fascinating and love hearing about this, but but primarily a show that sees history through the lens of food and cooking. We we can maybe fast forward then from her first novel. And I know you've touched on on the, the basics of it already, but at the, then at the age of 27, if my math is correct, she publishes what is then her already her seventh book, um, this one that you were talking about, um, her, her her sort of practical uh, book for the home, uh, you know, all of this advice focused on the home and practically the cooking and, you know, you got the recipes in it. And, and like you said in, in our correspondence, it, it made it probably one of the earliest American cookbooks, uh, which actually then became elevated to almost a home Bible status because, you know, every home almost had one. Uh, and, and one of the things that you mentioned, which I found so interesting, was that um, it became so popular, people could even recall which edition they had in, in their home at one point. So... Maybe tell us a bit more about the significance of this book. I know you've touched on it, the impact it had on American culture at the time, but I'd also love for you to just touch on some of the rather more humorous cooking tips that were in the book that uh, that you mentioned. Yes, thank you. Um, Yes, it was one of those books, and I'm sure there are such books in other cultures um, today. Certainly in my memory, I can remember exactly what the cover looked like of a couple of Mm. my mother's cookbooks. And, you know, the cookbooks that shaped her generation's idea of what it was to cook. And and that was true for the frugal housewife as well. There were people in their middle age who would still write to her and say, you know, I remember what the cover looked like. I remember my mother's edition. Um, and at the time, the reviews would say things like, no housewife should be caught without this book. Like it doesn't mm. really count as being a an American housewife if you don't have reference to this book. And I think, again, that's interesting because it showed a acknowledgement that even though she said she was writing for the poor and for those who are not ashamed of economy, that Americans were willing to identify with this book in a kind of scrappy American, we're going to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, we can do this way. And so I think it, it formed a kind of interesting pride um, that became part of American identity about being uh, being able to do without and to mm. be self sufficient and this famous kind of an American independent streak. Um, this was very much in that vein, and as I said, it was explicitly political in mm. at several moments. I mean, it would say things like, "What is the source of all our national woes?" It is the exorbitant luxury um, desired by all classes. So she would Mm. she would really in the midst of giving these recipes sort of turn around and say, what are you doing if you're not being frugal? You're not being a good American and you're you're engaging in behavior that is dangerous to our country's future. Um, so th- I always imagine that it was a little bit jarring for people who just like needed their recipe for how to cook the <laughs> goose that they just killed and they'd, they'd be paging through and instead, you know, be being told that they, they shouldn't travel as much or, they, yeah. you know, they yeah. needed to make sure that they uh, didn't. One of her pet peeves was people who bought preserves instead uh-huh. of making their own. So, yeah. But yeah, there there are so many lovely, funny um, moments in it. Most of them, you know, unintentionally funny. Yeah. But um, but looking back on it, the kinds of of cures that were suggested for people who had, as I say, dysentery or headaches, and like she suggests that you use molasses um, as shampoo. Um, she talks <laughs> about. Um, 
that you know you 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 never want to um, overcook a pig when you're roasting mm. a pig. So how do you know um, when the pig is is half done? It's when the eyeballs pop out. Um, <laughs> and this is just oh. this good, completely deadpan. Um, yeah. But one of my favorites is she just says at one point, "Beer is a good family drink." There we go. It, I couldn't agree more, really. But um, for obviously, part of what she would have been dealing with was trying to mm. find safe water or safe yep. things to drink. Um, yep. And since the way beer is is treated, it was more likely that it would be drinkable and it wouldn't make mm. you sick. Um, yeah. But but there are all kinds of little um, golden tidbits like that, and there are still people who who cook out of her recipes. Wow. Um, most famously, and I'll, if you'd like to talk about this in, in a bit, I'd be happy to, um, Julia Child, yeah. who is, well, yeah, the most famous American cookbook author of the 20th century. Uh, no relation. They shared a last name, ironically, but no relation. Mm -hmm. Um, but in one of her cookbooks, Julia Child replicates one of Lydia Mariah Child's recipes, um, wow. and praises her for, both for the the way the recipes were written and the formative influence they had on American cooking, um, but she also praises Child's, I think the phrase is, stern, rock-bound character wow. um, and, and mm. feminism, which I think is interesting. Mm. I mean, Julia Child, also an absolute um, icon in terms of strong female sort yes. of authorita authorita um, authoritativeness, should I yes. say. Um it's an amazing person to also recognize that in someone else and someone in, in a very similar field to herself. And I actually just recently did a, po a podcast episode all about Julia Child. And her yes, rise I and, listened to that. It's wonderful. Um, yes. Yeah. It's an incredibly interesting woman um, just kind of growing up and, and seeing how she became who she was. But also yes. just to touch on, um, I know you were talking about the the beer and, you know, how women used to actually be the you know, more so than men would be the brewers of beer. And I, in an episode that's coming out next week, we actually touch on, um, you know, the Salem witch trials, which is very close to you in Massachusetts. Yes. Um, and, and talking about then, you know, how a lot of what, a lot of the problem was that these women who decided they wanted to go out on their own or who wanted to heaven forbid, live on their own terms were the ones who are potentially the most susceptible to accusation for witchcraft because, they weren't conforming to society's norms or they weren't taking up that role as just that quiet housewife, you know? And I mean, that was, you know, end of the 1600s and it's only a hundred years later that, that Lydia is born. And, and she's very much in that mold of that, that, that woman who isn't going to go quietly. She, she wants to stand up for what she believes in. And it's almost interesting to see how much maybe potentially society had even changed, even just in that hundred years, that she, as much as, as much as she would have definitely faced, um, ostracization she would have definitely um, you know struggled especially being a woman in that time to to find her voice but she still had a she still had a voice more so than she would have done even just a few generations prior yeah I think that's true and things changed pretty rapidly within her lifetime as mm. well um, nowhere near as much as she had hoped of course I mean, when by the time she died women's suffrage was still 40 years away so as far as yes. political recognition um the news was still not good but even at the very beginning of her career she she later wrote that many people warned her that if she wrote books no one would ever take her seriously and certainly no one would marry her um <laughs> and it was only a couple of you know not even 15 years before Nathaniel Hawthorne, a very famous early American author, was complaining that what he called it something like that damned scribbling mass of women oh was gosh. outselling him. Yeah. So, so it, it wasn't long into the 19th century when women became authors um, and it, it became not as scandalous for women to mm. become authors. But mm. for the most part in the 19th century, the assumption was still that, you know, okay, women could write fiction and they could write children's literature and they could write mm. cookbooks, but they really shouldn't meddle in politics. And yeah, that's the men's never, domain, you know, don't talk about exactly politics that. at the dinner table, blah, blah, blah. Exactly. You know, right. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. And I'll also say on that topic, just briefly, that one of the most painful episodes in her life was 
after she joined the abolitionist movement and it was really picking up steam Mm. in the mid 1830s, the abolitionist movement split over the question of whether women should be allowed to speak. And at the beginning of the movement, there'd been, because it was a radical movement, they were open to all kinds of things, including women speaking. Mm. But as the, as more conservative people um, also wanted to join the movement, there became more pushback against that. Um, And at a certain point um, there was a, like literally a vote in which half of the, abolitionists walked out and formed their own society and refused to associate with the Garrisonian branch of abolitionism that child was a part of. So she was very aware that being a woman was often an impediment to her um, authorship, but also to her activism. It's very painful. Was that um, that other society that got formed, was that the anti-slavery standard? No, that was the National Anti-Slavery Standard was the journal that she helped publish through the American Anti-Slavery Society. Uh, um, the other one, to be honest with you, I don't. There were so many acronyms <laughs> at that point yeah. that I can't even remember which one they were. Um, okay. But there was a, another group that split off from the American Anti-Slavery Society, which was uh, a more Garrisonian society. So as she went along in in her struggle, from from what I, my reading and uh, you know and, and research of, of your paper and some of some other um, sources, it seemed like her ideologies seemed to be, and I, I actually think this is rather respectable. Her ideologies seemed to be rather malleable according to her experiences at the time, and I, I always say that because I think someone who is hardline, who believes something regardless of the facts that you know may present themselves, I, I think is always dangerous and so someone who is able to take experience and change what they're thinking is potentially is always noble but where once it said she was she was very anti the use of violence so much so that it actually caused her to leave one of the the anti-slavery groups you know then you know in a, in a couple of other podcasts I'd actually heard the story before and, and only in the research of this realized that there was a link between her and Senator Charles Sumner one yeah. of her fellow abolitionists who who was almost beaten to death on the Senate floor by another congressman, if you can believe it. I mean, that it's unbelievable to me. It was a turning point in her life to say maybe she began to realize that maybe violence was a necessary evil, especially in the protection of freed slaves and, and proponents of anti-slavery fighting for change themselves. But in your, in your research, are there any other examples from her life of how her feelings and her ideologies evolved as time went on through her abolitionist and suffrage struggles? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. And I I agree with you that one of the things that's really remarkable to me about her is that despite the fact that she took a very radical position very early and stuck with it over Mm -hmm. decades, um, she was never the kind of abolitionist who was so ideological that she would um, refuse to speak to people she disagreed with. She and and this was part of a, another very painful episode in her life where she was essentially ousted from the Garrisonian abolitionist wing because they thought she had become too moderate, and that was a period at which some other Garrisonians were doing what was called come outism, which meant that they would just denounce anyone who wasn't fully not just anti-slavery, but anti-slavery in the way they wanted to be Mm anti-slavery. So, you know, today we call that a litmus test. Um, There are all kinds of ways in which that problem is replicating itself, certainly in American society, and I I think other places in the world as well, um, where there's a kind of ideological purity that says, if you're not 100% with us, even if you're kind of an ally, but not the kind of ally we want, you're Mm. part of the problem. And right. she always resisted that. Um, and I I say that as in admiration, but also in acknowledgement that if there ever were a topic that it would feel like is worth ideological purity, it would seem to be enslavement. I mean, to, sure. to enslave millions of people mm. in the most brutal conditions possible. Sure seems like a moment at which ideological purity would be defensible. Mm. But I think child just thought it wouldn't work. You know, you you could be a purist like that, but you would turn people away and you would actually fail in your goals. So I think um, 
again, it's a very astute observation on your point that on your part that that was something that she was good at. As far as other moments, um, other parts of her life where she changed, I think her stance towards herself as a woman did change as well. There were times early in her life where just kind of despite her behavior, she would mm. say things like, but women are really best suited to the domestic sphere. Um, wow. And she would say things like, I wouldn't vote if they let me because um, politics is a dirty business. And again, wow. it's better to have separate spheres. And I think by the end of her life, she had come to realize that that was a, an essentialism that she didn't want to engage mm. in anymore. And also just had a lifetime of evidence that women could be powerful political change right. makers and that men often were so entrenched in their own power stru structure that they mm. didn't, they weren't able to see or do the right thing, even if they, even if they could. So I think right. on both of those topics, um, she, she shifted her opinion pretty substantially. Mm. Well, we're coming to the almost end of our time. I've got a few more questions. Um, but uh, one of them it was, I, I in reading about her life, it seemed like she grew up quite uh, in quite a religious home. She had a she had a Puritan father, as you mentioned. To say, in some of the writings, said she even used to sleep with a Bible under her pillow. And later in life, seemed like she went very much the other way, very anti-religion. You know, renounced sort of her faith and all of that. But do you think that those early seeds of of faith and religion had any part in shaping? that sense of justice in her? I do. Um, she always, I think the last time she would have called herself a Christian of any kind would have been in her early twenties. Um, wow. And she was very clear that she respected Jesus as a figure and mm. always spoke in reverential terms of his message of non-resistance, right? Turning the other cheek and love and love for all mankind. So, but she was very disappointed in what the religion of Christianity had done and had re in, in the ways in which it had really betrayed Jesus message as she right. saw it. So very late in her life, she wrote a book in which she collected uh, religious wisdom from all kinds of traditions. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that um, is radical about that book is she just sort of put Jesus next to Socrates or Plato yeah. or whoever yeah. else as a, as a wise human being. Um, so I think there's no question that she got some of her thoughts about justice from learning about Jesus message and then took that into a much more cosmopolitan understanding of religion um, fairly sure. early in her life. Well, I think it speaks a lot to her her character, um, you know, to be able to to turn so far away from from religion, but but yet still be someone who fought for religious freedoms. And I, I think that that does speak, you know, quite a lot to to her. Uh, Lydia, before we go, are there any last anecdotes about her life that you haven't shared that you've got burning in your pocket that uh, I haven't picked up on, or something that you you know just go like this one story is just so great, something just to whet our appetites one last time before we all go out and pre-order your book. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, yes, there is, and it has to do with food, um, and that is that in the late 1830s, she and her husband, in another attempt to try to undermine slavery moved from Boston to the middle of Massachusetts, which would have been quite a significant journey at that time, to farm sugar beets. Wow. So sugar beets had never been grown for food in the United States. Her husband went to Europe to try to learn how to do this. He came back with the knowledge and the very expensive machinery. They, again, they moved to this place called Northampton, and staked their entire financial well-being on the hope that a new kind of food could end slavery. So they wow. thought if you could replace sugar, grow, sugar, cane sugar grown on plantations with sugar beets, then there would not be the incentive to continue slavery in the South. Wow. Um, this was a, an unbelievably risky gamble. Um, I mean, you just think about how hard it is to convince people to eat something they haven't eaten before and to mm. substitute a pantry staple like plantation grown mm -hmm. cane sugar with beet sugar. Um, it, it was, it was incredibly heavy lift. Mm. 
And indeed it failed. They tried very hard to do that on and off for about 10 years and they went bankrupt. They lost everything Um, in this attempt to try to make food a part of their commitment to justice. So I tell that story in one of the chapters of the book. It's it's a fairly painful story. It's full of Mm. idealism and hope um, and people trying to do absolutely everything they could to um, to fight an evil, and in the end, it causing quite a bit of, of um, personal hardship. I'll just say that, um, this isn't a spoiler, but I'll say that I end the book with an image of myself in Northampton uh, at a farm, a community farm, where they now grow sugar beets in honor wow. of child and her husband as a way of um, preserving that history and also inspiring people to think of food as one mm. of the ways in which we can actively engage in um, questions of justice in our lives. Unreal. Come full circle. Yes. Well, uh, we've come to the end of our time, but before we go, um, I would love for you just to tell us a little bit about what we can expect in your book. I know you've spoken a lot about her and her life. You just tell us a bit about what we can expect. And then also, how do we get our hands on a copy of your, of your book, Lydia Mariah Child, A Radical American Life? Thank you. It is, um, it's a story of her whole life. And part of what I love about her life is that it intersects in fascinating ways with some of the biggest moments in American history. So for any Mm. of your listeners who are Civil War buffs, um, her life intersects, as you mentioned, with the caning of Charles Sumner, with John Brown's insurrection, uh, failed insurrection in 1859. And Harper's also Ferry. with one of the most important memoirs of enslavement in mm. the United States, Harriet Jacobs. She helped Jacobs um, publish that book. So in a way, it's a it's a tour of American mm. history, but from a, a perspective that that is really unlike most books that are published about the Civil War. Let me put it that way. <laughs> um, but also there are, there are other major moments post civil war that i came to of american history that i came to understand much better through her life so um there's a lot of heartbreak but also a lot of inspiration in the story and i i hope um readers will will enjoy that and it's available on wherever books are sold in the united states for sure is also on amazon it can also be mm. ordered from the university of chicago press uh, which is what the press that published it. Um, so it, it shouldn't be hard to get your hands on a copy at this point, I hope. Great. Um, so Are you doing ebooks as well? Um, yes. Yep. Yeah, there is a, an ebook option. Great. So that's also a possibility. Fantastic. Well, thank you again, Lydia, for your time with us today. I know I'm already enjoying the manuscript that you sent through. I can't wait to finish it. Um, and for everybody else who's listening, please go and pre order Lydia's book. I'm sure it hasn't come out just yet. Am I correct? Uh, not not officially, but they. The, I think the printing went so smoothly that it was available faster than they thought, and so it is actually oh. physically in some bookstores now. Oh, fantastic! Okay, well, go down to your local bookstore, get it. I'm sure uh, it'll be up for sale, or links to it at least will be on your website. The one that I found at least, which was web.colby.edu/lmoland. Uh, the link I know will be in the show description wherever this is uh, shown, either on YouTube or on the podcast uh, show notes. But uh, Lydia, thank you again for your time. Really do appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I would encourage everybody to go out and learn more about this fantastic woman in history uh, and how it intersects with food. And like you say, so many other phenomenal moments just in the history of America. So Lydia, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for this wonderful interview and for your wonderful podcast. Thank you. We'll chat again soon.